So welcome to Design at Large, the winter 2022 lecture series for the Design Lab at UC San Diego. I'm Lisa Cartwright, and I am here with the seventh of our episodes for the winter 2022 From the Sky to the Ocean Floor series. And I first would like to begin by acknowledging once again that uh, we are situated on Kumeyaay land on the coast of La Jolla, California. And many of our talks are engaging with questions of land rights and appropriation of land. And uh, we continue along those lines with today's lectures from Stephanie Sherman and Danielle Dean, lecture and artist talk about their separate work around the Fordlandia um, development uh, put in place by the Ford Motor Company along the Amazon River in Brazil. And um, their work was not conducted as a collaboration, so it kind of breaks from our pattern in the series where we've been focusing mostly on people who have been collaborating together, but it's been um, a kind of joint uh, parallel and intersecting development of projects that are so different from one another and yet are so deeply informed by the the politics and the commitments of the UC San Diego Visual Arts Department and Design Lab. I'm going to begin by introducing Stephanie Sherman who will speak first. And we have on our screen the page for the San Diego Tijuana Design, uh, World Design Capital Award that the Design Lab has just been given. San Diego and, and Tijuana have been selected as the 2024 World Design Capital, which is a really big deal. And we are so delighted to have Stephanie Sherman here because she was the lead author on the World Design Capital bid in which our um, competition was very stiff. And in the last round, we outbid Russia. Um, so uh, at this moment, she is lead strategist on the, the design transition team, as well as a member of the design lab automation and community team. Um, so Stephanie is a London-based director, producer, and writer working across social and speculative design. Her projects reprogram outmoded sites, systems, and surplus as platforms for co-production. I first got to know Stephanie Sherman when she was repurposing a, um, an amusement park outside Berlin that had fallen into disrepair and turning it into a kind of cultural social arts uh, site where um, that engaged with the politics of, of the, the location. She's completing her PhD. She'll be defending in the fall in the visual arts department at UC San Diego, where she is one of our elite group of art practice PhD students. And she is the director of the MA Narrative Environments program at Central St. Martins in uh, the University of the Arts London. She is the, as I've mentioned, the lead strategist for the San Diego T1 World Design Capital 2024 designation, but that doesn't even begin to speak to everything that Stephanie Sherman has contributed to the transformation of the design lab in the, in the past six years. So um, we are so delighted to welcome her back in what will be her last public presentation to the lab as a PhD student um, and we are very proud that she's here as a professor at the same time. Um, and I'm going to introduce Danielle at the same time. Um, their talks will be back to back. It is my tremendous pleasure to introduce Danielle Dean, who is a studio artist in the visual arts department. She is an interdisciplinary artist whose work explores geopolitics and material processes that colonize the body and the mind, drawing from the aesthetics and history of advertising and from her own multinational background. Daniel Dean was born to a Nigerian father and an English mother in Alabama, brought up in a suburb of London. Her work explores the ideological function of technology, architecture, uh, marketing, media, animation, uh, tools of subjection, oppression, and resistance as they are articulated through multimedia platforms that engage with the, the history of um, dynamics in media from popular animated cinema 
and the racialized and uh, fantasy worlds that we encountered there to the contemporary politics of um, Amazon Turk that we'll hear about a little bit today in her work on Fordlandia and the kind of pun between the Amazon River and Amazon that's taking over all of our lives and drowning all of us. Danielle Dean received her MFA from, from CalArts and is an alumni of the Whitney Independent Study Program, um, which is a, a world-renowned critical theory think tank and launch pad for cutting edge artists, artists who work on, on socio-political issues. Uh, she was uh, part of the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture. Her recent solo ex exhibitions include Amazon at the Tate Britain, which is a premier exhibition site in London, Amazon Proxy at Performa 21 Biennial in New York, um, which yet another world-class platform, Trigger Torque at the Ludwig in Germany, True Red Ruin at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Detroit, Bazaar at, at 47, Canal in New York landed at Cubit Gallery in London and focused Danielle Dean at the Studio Museum in Harlem in New York. Her work has been included in group exhibitions uh, all over the world in Amsterdam, Athens, uh, New York, Paris, London, Geneva, uh, Lagos. And uh, she was part of the recent um, Made in LA um, at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, among many other venues. So welcome to Stephanie Sherman and to Daniel Dean in their Together But Separate projects on Fordlandia. Stephanie Sherman, we look forward to hearing your talk. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, and thank you all. Thanks, Lisa, for the invitation, the design lab, and um, and let you all know that I am calling in from London. And so it's just after midnight here. So you'll have to Forgive if I can't find a word. It's because even I couldn't possibly drink coffee this late. So we'll just have to um, do do what we can here. But it's it's really an honor to participate in the Design at Large series. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about a, one aspect of my PhD work, which looks at really the prehistories of platform automation and how Fordism and the automobile shaped platformation and automation both today and their contemporary formation and how it might be to come. Um, and the, my project started almost a decade ago in a time before Uber and a time before the tram to campus. And I was newly moved to California. And every morning I would sit in bumper to bumper traffic in a borrowed SUV that I disaffectionately called the fat suit. Um, and I would marvel at the atrocious waste associated with the automobile, time, petrol, space, carbon. And I started to ask about this phenomenon as a function of design, um, not only that there was something totally irretrievable and path dependent about design um, and the automotive system, but really how design for the individual, for the self or the auto, overtook design for interdependent systems um, and sort of it as an expression of what happens when infrastructure is designed in reaction to the proliferation of an individual device. Um, and so looking around and just realizing how much we carved up the earth with concrete to accommodate the automobile, it became really clear to me that we were on the precipice of this other transition um, and that the self-driving car, if done with the same disregard for the impacts of automobility, would duplicate the atrocities of the 20th century. Um, and so I had this absurd thought that one does when you sit in traffic, um, which was what would happen if we went back in time and killed Henry Ford? And um, it was a really easy counterfactual and a silly one because in many ways, um, one man or one person can, couldn't possibly have changed a kind of much broader socio-technical development. But at the same time, um, I was so aware that we were really still living in the world that Ford created and that he precipitated and accelerated. And sort of what was the most interesting is that when I went back, when I started kind of exploring, okay, what was this history all about? And looking into the archives, I found things that I realized I couldn't possibly have made up 
that the reality was much, much stranger um, than and in fiction, and that in fact I didn't need to invent a counterfactual at all because almost the history itself was one. Um, and I started to think about the Model T really as a precursor to the iPhone, um, the ways that it set the precedent for platform automation and planetary mobility um, based on the radical transformation of the individual through a new dependence and an extension of an individual device. Um, and in this sense, we can understand Ford's autom automobile as part of a platform ecosystem that he designed, a consequence of network effects, of lock-in, of and a particular distribution of risk um, pushed to the margins. And there's a lot of ways we can think about Ford's work and this device and as a platform of platforms, that it's not just the device. I mean, we can start with the um, chassis, which is the foundation of the car, which we is otherwise known as the platform. Um, and if you think about the platform as like a, a, a thing that allows other things to be built upon it in its most um, baseline definition. So there's, you know, the standardized chassis upon which the customized Model T could become or be interpreted by its users um, and as almost anything um, from very serious things like uh, cars that enable doctor's visits to tr trucks to a circus truck um, to, to a much broader understanding of the platform of platforms. So um, the moving assembly line itself as a mobile, as a mobile platform and a mobility platform and as a specific application of a general purpose technology um, and production process that was contingent on standardized parts. Um, and of course, it's not at all that that world of the assembly line has left us. It's just shifted to different locations. Um, Ford's the whole um, global apparatus of Ford Motor Company was also part of a logistics platform um, that used knock up and knock down kits and processes to avoid national tariffs. So sort of setting a platform legacy of national border circumvention, which is still part of platform provenance today. Ford also leveraged the company platform as a media outlet. Um, using it to perpetuate populist ideologies, very similar to the platform co-optation we all know well. And I also discovered that Ford had the biggest motion picture company of any filmmaker at the time, and that he created and distributed newsreels to movie houses all over the world, uh, early example of product placement. Um, one of the most popular Ford motion pictures was Thomas Edison and Ford and Burroughs, on what they called adventure tours, which romantically followed the megalomaniacs into the wilderness with their cars, escaping urban environs that were increasingly full of them. Now, of course, there was indeed an existing very real need for internal combustion, but that was really fulfilled in rural environments where obviously shipping um, made a tremendous difference. But in the city, um, the what made the car ubiquitous was not really designing supply, but designing demand and desire. So there was plenty of other competitors with Ford, um, but he not only made a cheap car, but provided dealership support to decomplexify um, individual ownership with the new invention and sold coverage in the Ford network as a sort of pragmatic access point to a new modern world. So he created the, the network effects and built the desire. And so even though he was one in a million car makers, what distinguished him was this attention to the whole platform ecosystem accompanied by a spectacle of the possible. Now, at the peripheries of Ford's global platform, I encountered the story of Fordlandia, a failed jungle city started by Ford in the Brazilian Amazon. And I started to see this as emblematic of platform systems more generally, that they have also have their own pathologies or tendencies towards mistakes or propulsions, towards systems errors, especially at the fringes. Now, this whole saga pivots around 1927, the same year that the River Rouge production plant finally opened, marking the culmination of Fordist vertical integration. And almost every single element is produced or processed in-house, the River Rouge, um, or supplied by Ford-owned networks across the globe. That is all elements except for one, 
rubber, which is the final missing link in the Ford production chain. Now, interestingly enough, during the Industrial Revolution, steam power notoriously liberated factories from being required to be located on waterways. But Ford himself, kind of this famous bastion of Industrial Revolution technologies, notably always insisted on building his plants on water because water provided an existing shipping highway. So by 1927, the Ford network really does stretch globally across Europe, South America, the Middle East, and some parts of Asia. The, the river network stretched as far as the River Volga in Russia, where Fo Ford sold the Soviets an entire production system for tractors and trucks that enabled the transformation from rural landscape to socialist regime. regime. The Russian Agricultural Agency was in touch with Ford also about the rubber experiments that were ongoing at Edison's Winter Estate in Fort, Myer Fort Myers, Florida, an initiative of Firestone, Ford, and Edison that was formalized as the Botanical Research Corporation in early 1927. And the three saw rubber as a material in increasing industrial demand and wanted independence from the British East Asian monopoly, which had fixed prices on supply. So later that year in 1927, Ford's men traveled to Brazil and with incredible haste, purchased a plot of land on the Tapajos River in the Amazon jungle. This wasn't Ford's first attempt to kind of start a small ecosystem with social and cultural um, uh, coordination alongside production. So he had been long interested in social experiments at village or city scale, including the attempted and failed purchase of the unfinished World War I Muscle Shoals hydroelectric plant in Alabama, a plant intended to harvest nitrate fertilizer that would accelerate his fascination with agricultural systems, but the government wouldn't sell it to him. And in the spring of 1928, a Norwegian sea captain led an expedition of resources from Detroit to the new Amazonian site. The bounty included tractors, prefabricated buildings and houses, a sawmill, food, hospital equipment, a powerhouse, ice making machinery and railroad equipment, quote, everything that spells, spells civilization to a white man. So the setbacks begin right away um, as the ship failed to catch the river's high season in the early spring and rejecting they they let, rejected local offers of help, which costs almost a year to get there since the low season leaves the property inaccessible right by river until a year later. And once they arrive, the Norwegian ship captain, who's appointed kind of plantation manager without a lick of, um, of experience in cultivating rubber or really any um, biocultivation for that matter, his first order of business is to burn the area to make way for the plantation, destroying all the soil nutrients as well as the relationships with the inhabitants. And in the, in the USA, Ford famously paid workers $5 a day, which brought workers flooding to Detroit, which provided supply for um, a continuous motor car production. And he did the same in the Amazon, offering 35 cents a day, which was a very high wage compared to other areas, bringing tappers to the plantation. But the tappers were pretty accustomed to the British rubber system. The British had been in the Amazon in this area before and had left for um, East Asia. But they were accustomed to a system where they were paid per bucket um, and so rather than paid per hours. And so now Ford workers are forced to work through the heat. Are they outfitted with worker ID badges, whistles and uniforms processed, regulated and standardized by the hour? Unlike the thatched open air roof huts designed by tribes to avoid insects and heat, the prefab enclosed houses spread yellow fever, malaria, and hookworm across the Tapper community. And they're encouraged to do all sorts of funny suburban things like plant gardens as a leisure activity, which is a complete irony amongst a lush jungle backdrop. And um, Ford and Edison really saw the project as a civilizing one from the get-go. Um, so paternalistic offerings at the site included square dances and English poetry readings and sing-alongs and a ban on hammocks. Now, 
that's just on the social side. On the rubber cultivation front, the rubber trees are packed close together in standardized rows, and the monocultural planting makes them easy prey for a proliferation of agricultural pathologies. Tree blight, sava ants, lace bugs, red spiders, and leaf caterpillars. Now, it's also to say that there's little incentive for the tappers to stay at the Ford complex once some money has been saved, since the minimal local goods on offer at the Fordlandia store, including high heels, uh, don't offer compelling commercial products for Amazonian landscape, unlike in Detroit, where high pay incentives Incent high pay incentivizes workers to invest surplus desire in consuming the fruits of their labor. Here, the high pay for rubber tapping offers no immediate reward. And there's all these regulations against alcohol, prostitution, um, and even though these rules apply to all, the manager managers don't follow them. And so just beyond the bounds of the Fordlandia port property, an island of innocence springs up, an enclave of bars, brothels and nightclubs with a black market voting system to boot. Now, if there's anything that's wonderful about um, Fordlandia, it's the hospital, um, which is really treasured by, by the community um, with rows of patients functioning actually much better than the rows of plants. And angels in white gowns in a clean, air-conditioned, electrified space concoct cures for the perpetrations unleashed in the Amazon's destruction. And it's also a research platform a, for cataloging. Specimens are sent back to the Ford Hospital in Detroit to capture tropical creatures and diseases, of which there are many losses. Now, in 1930, the population peaks at 10,000 and a worker rebellion is tipped off by a simple switch really from proper table service in the company restaurant to American style cafeteria service, cafeteria style service and food at lunchtime. Declaring themselves workers, not waiters, a riot unfurls. Uh, machine workers and tappers set fire to the lands and homes and processing factories. Workers smash the plantation time clocks, symbols of the new illogical and inefficient Ford Fordist regulatory system. The few managers who survived the riot do so by an air rescue from a Pan Am billionaire residing in Brazil, and the revolt is eventually suppressed with support from the Brazilian government. Now, at this very moment, the radio station that was typically used to communicate with Detroit is hijacked, and the rebellion is communicated along the Tapajos River, supporting the tappers that are working in the rebellion. And all the property is burned and Ford declares Fordlandia a research station and moves up the plantation to a new city called Belterra, a hundred miles upstream. And it suffers from almost all the same mistakes. Uh, monoculture, a rotating crop of Ford managers with no scientific knowledge about the conditions and almost the same failures. But, there's a few learnings from Fordlandia that are cultivated in the new city of Belterra. So an emphasis on more established infrastructure compels long-term investment and care for the city by locals. Necessities like roads, fire hydrants, electricity, free healthcare, education, offer much more compelling reasons for local af affection than square dancing and swimming pools. But what really leads to the downfall of Fordlandia is the Soviet invention of synthetic rubber in 1946. And so then that year, Henry Ford II, the new president, sells the property back to the Brazilian government at a loss of over 20 million US dollars. And Ford dies the following year. So the, the city itself is afterwards abandoned for many years, but then Actually, for an equally long time, it has been re-inhabited and revived. Um, and after studying this history for many years, I found out that Fordlandia had today, or in the contemporary sense, had an existing radio station that was much beloved. And I heard that that station had closed down because its operator had moved lo locations. And I'm a part of a group of radio producers. And so we were excited to go to Fordlandia and do research, but also explore how using the radio might be a way of exploring platforms that could be programmed towards mo more co-constructive ends. Radio Espacio Estación, radioee.net. 
an online nomadic multilingual radio station. Mm -hmm. The local radio at Forlandia ran for over 10 years and it was owned and operated by Beto Taranachinga. The show provided entertainment, news, and culture and was a much beloved community outlet. Radio EE's Brazilian artists and organizers will host a series of workshops at the Fordlandia School, teaching local youth how to operate the FM station and working with them to create sound works for broadcast during the opening weekend, all transmitted live via the new FM station and online at radioee.net. We'll leave the station equipment with a simple operating system behind so the local youth can keep the radio going. We are asking our listeners. And um, that was our project proposal, a little clip from our Kickstarter video. Um, and we were also supported by Apex Art, an um, art organization in New York, to kind of take the trip and go. And it was really sort of similar to the things that we imagined, um, full of adventure and boats to get there, um, full of disclosures, things that we had never seen on the internet. strange sculptures that didn't appear in any of the pictures, fetishizing an abandoned ruin. And we spent three weeks there using the radio as sort of a tool to meet people on their terms. We hosted workshops with the local school where the radio would be housed. And students really learned the radio as a new communications platform. So together, we organized a 36-hour broadcast in Portuguese, English, and Spanish. And we broadcast from the warehouse on the Tapajos. And our online network partnered with other stations in Amazon, Sao Paulo, Miami, and Detroit to retransmit and really tell the stories, the contemporary stories of what people were experiencing now. So the radio generated a platform for Fordlandia residents to articulate struggles for governance, economy, and resources. And the principle was really a logic of platform incubation rather than extraction. Instead of taking away stories to portray in a museum or a scholarly book, we co-created with them a platform infrastructure to leave behind. And there's still, of course, many beautiful places in the city to be rehabilitated. And the outmoded factories are not really abandoned at all, actually. They're abandoned perhaps by humans, but they're inhabited by swarms of bugs and bacteria, a growing village agricultural experiment. And then there's these other municipal buildings that continue to provide a source of incredible pride in their construction, which speaks to longevity rather than cheap or throwaway arrangements. This architecture was designed to supersede a, ge a single generation. And contrary to the kind of Western anthropological myths that refute dreams of technological progress, here technological connectivity is in the same demand as in the rest of the planet. Students are on Facebook and WhatsApp. Um, the hardware just takes slightly different forms. And the students say that the, perhaps the rubber wasn't really the reason Ford was there at all. It turns out that by raising the ground, Ford could access all sorts of other things beneath the surface. There are mining tunnels running beneath the entire city. We've been to them, the kids tell the world. One older woman who worked on Ford's plantation tells of how she once saw a log being loaded onto an export ship and that that log rolled off and broke and inside it was full of diamonds and gold. The symbol slips from its referent, just as Ford's plan to solve a rubber challenge turned into a civilizing one. And Ford was ahead of his time too in this way as this soy car, a car made completely of soy that he dreamt of, um, was a dream of an industrialized world full of the application of agricultural products that was very much a Fordian idea in some ways way ahead of its time. 
For now, what was once looked like a forest looks more like fields intent on producing vegetarian fodder and biopower. And so in one form or another, we've all, all, always been terraforming and adjusting and reshaping this territory. And in this way, Fordlandia is really a demonstration of this. The soy industry has also precipitated massive growth, prefabricated industrial housing and industrial civilization techniques at a scale Ford, even Ford couldn't have foretold. And there's a bigger slip in the Fordian platform story, which is that even a cursory visit to the Amazon makes explicit that it's the boat, not the car. That's the most obvious opportunity for mobility innovation. And that the social and technical network in which a platform is situated is as contingent and critical as its core operation. So Fordlandia failed because it overlooked the social and contextual conditions of platform design the demands of adaptability and incubation, the construction of a network and desire as such. And so the Fordist platform and the Amazon did not catch. Although if you take the fast boat, you can see that it's um, plenty contemporary and technologized. Now in 1931, Huxley took a boat trip in San Francisco and read for Henry Ford's My Life and Work and saw it in it all that was wrong with American civilization. And he wrote A Brave New World, which is a story based on Fordlandia. And in that book, the savage natural world of Fordlandia provides an alternative to the efficiency, consumerism, and standardized production of capitalism. But Fordlandia's own inhabitants would prefer neither a return to nature as is, nor continued exploitation of jungle resources, Rather, they are seeking to become part of a platform for regrowth with their own autonomy and interdependence and visibility for their city as having its own logic and function, not only a projection of Ford. So the slip first appeared in Freud's 1902 book, The Psychopathology of Everyday Life. Freud argued that in the guise of a mistake or misnomer, slips disclose unconscious desires. What appears as an accident can be traced back to an impulse that unwittingly rises to the surface, a suppressed desire that escapes in the flow of movement. And while slips are in language are most commonly referenced, Freud notes that slips also take the form of forgetfulness and errors of judgment, the inability to apply the complexity of one condition to another at the right scale. And so we might see the Fordian slip as the mistaken reappropriation of monoculture rather than the cultivation of infrastructure. And the pathologies of platforms are as much built in fringes on the edge of megalomaniacal systems as they are the most good willing and best intention projections of our own desires that we superimpose on them. And that's it, thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. We can take just one or two quick questions before we move to Danielle Dean's talk. If there are any. I see lots of wow and fantastic in the chat. Um, okay, we don't so have any- So I have a question. Great. Oh, sorry. Um, so I think your um, your point was that um, this development was doomed to fail. Um, was there any way in which it could have succeeded? I think so. I don't think it was necessarily doomed to fail, but I think it's one of the key functions of platform logics is that they're incredibly path dependent. So things start off on the wrong path and then that path precipitates more wrong paths. You can kind of think about it like in the way that uh, Facebook has an individual user and that, that maybe that path of one single individual user sets Facebook up to fail from the very beginning. 
but I don't think it's doom. And I think that there was many ways in which um, all the choices and actions along the way continue to perpetuate this ideology rather than kind of enabled something like an ecosystem or a production ecosystem that maybe would have been harmful for the planet, but certainly would have been better embraced by the Tapper community that was there. So it was more about like a reduction of, um, of the culture and the ecosystem and just actual efficiency. Um, so really failing to understand that kind of that cycle of desire and production that was there at once. Okay, that's interesting. Um, there was another <clears throat> big industrial project in the Amazonian region. Um, I'm sure you have heard of uh, Bata, uh, the, the shoes, B-A-T-A. -A. Um, uh, he, after he was um, stripped of his possessions in uh, Czechoslovakia, he moved there and started a community um, uh, which was producing shoes. Um, and that also eventually failed. Yeah, and there was a company town associated with it as well. So there is also kind of, I suppose, a lineage of um, South American resistance to these kind of colonization efforts. Thanks, Stephanie, and thank you, Peter, for, for your question, um, Lilia Rani has followed up with a question about platform. So why is platform an important concept to rehabilitate here? Why would infrastructure or just shared space or media not have served? Yeah, I guess um, I think what happens with the concept is that when we take platforms to only mean kind of pairing two-sided markets, and that's the only way that we interpret them, that we actually lose a much bigger picture about what they are and what their potential might be in terms of, let's say, platform reprogramming. Um, and so it seems like there's the potential for some of these infrastructures to actually be more responsive um, to, what, to what needs are and that they could apply those logics both from kind of an infrastructural but also in a responsive way to their users in a way that's far more significant and incorporative and non-exploitative than they tend to do. So I think that's why like kind of tracing the history and looking at the different ways that actually users help to create this ecosystem also contains the seeds of what might be um, repurposed from it. Thank you, Lily. Do you want to just jump in with your follow up that you have in the chat before we? It's a great segue, actually, to Danielle Dean's talk. So, yeah, sure. I mean, where the question was coming from was, you know, platform as a, you know, I've seen kind of two lineages of the term platform. One is kind of the tech industry, and Charlton Gillespie has a paper, The Politics of Platforms, where he talks about how the concept sort of both points to um, systems that both enable and then also the build, so the builder of the platform sort of disavows accountability for what is produced on the platform while at the same time kind of extracting you know money or some kind of credit for having created the platform so it's like platform has a kind of um like a seminal like uh, it makes a seminal claim on like what's generated on it uh, thereafter while kind of maybe disclaiming responsibility for what's generated and so that what that didn't seem as aligned with the politics of co-construction that you're describing with this project um, and so that's why I thought infrastructure might be a less loaded concept to draw on. Yeah mm -hmm. I think that's true but I also think that like in the social and cultural sphere there's lots of ways where we think about actually creating platforms as pieces of community infrastructure that have a different set of principles that also enable different kinds of functions and that like Sometimes uh, I don't. I, we were talking about this word infrastructure um, that it's so often associated with like these giant pieces of hardware, and mm -hmm. in in such a way that actually platform suggests a kind of nimbleness and and a way of incorporating user response and a flexibility that um, might might be able to be rehabilitated in a more successful way. So 
that's a fair point given the history of the World Bank being the like World Infrastructure Bank or whatever it was called <laughs> post World War II. Thanks. Thank you. I think infrastructure is a is a great segue to the work of Daniel Dean, who is a professor in the Visual Arts Department here at UC San Diego and um, a frequent participant in design lab activities. So welcome, Danielle Dean, and we look Hi. forward to, to your half of this presentation on Fordlandia. Okay, great. Let me just share my screen. Okay, do you guys all see a Ford advert? Okay, great. So um, first of all, thank you so much for your talk, Stephanie. It was amazing and um, such a lot of great research and things that I had looked at as well, but um, obviously have looked at it in a different way. So anyway, okay, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I obviously, um, you know that I'm a visual artist and I um, work in many different mediums like uh, video, installation, sculpture, drawing, animation, anything that suits the conceptual side of the project. Um, and my, my practice is really based on research, um, both historical and archival. Um, each, every project that I do um, involves um, an archive in, in some way. Um, and I also experiment with different modes of production, like for example, a, a type of social practice or something like an experimental um, ethnography. So the focus today is on Fordlandia. Um, and I came across Fordlandia when, uh, when I was um, uh, living in Detroit, but I first was actually focused on Ford in general. I mean, when you live in Detroit, you, you can't ignore Ford, it's like everywhere. Um, and so one of the things that I did when I was there is I managed to access a um, archive of Ford advertisements. And um, there was, I actually found this guy who was an enthusiastic collector of, of different Ford ads um, throughout time. And he allowed me to um, photograph these adverts. So this is an example of a Ford ad from 1924. And um, what really interests me in this kind of like broad, um, you know, because I mean, there's adverts from earlier than 1924, and it, it just really struck me how um, landscape was always present in these adverts. And I was really interested in how landscape was represented in relation to the car in these ads. Um, the car is often positioned in the front and um, there's, you know, always something to do with perspective and the human is always, you know, at the center of these landscapes and the car is meant to be this kind of like, you know, way in which one can consume these landscapes um, in, in these car ads. And so I, I was also interested in the early car ads because they often were paintings um, as opposed to what we're used to advertising being photography or digital um, imagery. Um, and I was interested in that because for me, painting has a closer relationship to the imaginary. And, um, you know, it seemed to me like these, and I think like you were talking about this a little, um, Stephanie, the production of desire that, that Ford managed to create around these cars and um, the advertisements would have been a big part of that. Um, so I was really interested in the connection between the assembly line and the ideological construction of the American dream that for me seemed to be very present in these ads. Um, I was thinking about a, a kind of assembly line of the image and the production of the imaginary. And, um, uh, one of the things that I was also thinking about was how um, there's a relationship, I think, between these early Ford uh, car ads and uh, the depictions in Walt Disney. Um, and actually, Walt Disney was obsessed with Ford and Fordist me methods of tailorism, like breaking down the separate parts of, of production of his Disney films to create these efficient ways of making these you know, elaborate films that are so, um, you know, so much in, in um, our imagination. 
and uh, apparently Walt Disney also actually visited Fordlandia. Um, so for me, there was a connection between Disney's, um, you know, representations of landscapes and uh, Ford's representations of landscapes and within the, the car ads. Um, so I decided to make an animation using a digital version of a technique that Walt Disney used called the multiplane camera. Um, the multiplane camera, camera comes out of a uh, production that mimics the Ford assembly line and was actually this very large apparatus that um, was apparently made from car parts um, and was used in lots of Disney films, in particular, for example, um, Bambi comes to mind. And it um, essentially uses large planes of glass that, that split the landscape into layers and creates a mechanical um, uh, parallax view. So it feels like you're inhabiting the, 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 spa the space of the landscape with these 2D images. <clears throat> and so this drawing here is an example of me doing the same, using the same method. Um, so, you know, in this, this is the original that I uh, used of this, of this particular Ford ad. And then this is the sky layer of this parallax view. Um, and then this is, you know, the foreground. And this video just talks a little bit about this um, um, animation technique. Do you guys hear the sound or was there no, was there no sound? Okay, There's I just no have sound. to, yeah, reshare and allow for the sound to be, give me one second. This should, okay, let me just play this again. Can you hear sound now? Does, do you the different yeah. elements in the scene were separated according to their varying distances from the viewer. With our original picture broken down in this manner, it is possible to control the relative speed with which each individual part of it moves to or away from the camera. So um, in effect, this type of um, representation of landscape becomes a um, efficient way of depicting um, uh, uh, you know, space, it kind of uses the assembly line to, to um, create a representation of landscape, which ignores the complex e ecologies and connections in, in actual reality in nature. The production of images or the imaginary has an effect on the real. Um, and I, I think that these depictions, you know, they put humans at the center of land and um, when we, um, you know, have this kind of way in which the, these landscapes are split into separate parts, it can really justify uh, ways in which we can, um, you know, justify the extracting from them, as if land can be pulled apart into separate parts for our, our use. And so I was also thinking at the same time about this in relation to Fordlandia, um, which also happen to um, extract raw rubber, as Stephanie was talking about. And, um, you know, this efficient assembly line way of organizing the plantation of, on the Fordlandia meant that it wasn't too, they didn't really yield that much rubber because um, rubber trees do best in diverse forests. And when planted close together, they're vulnerable to what is called tree blight or, you know, different bugs which was one of the big failures of, of Fordlandia. So the animation that I created um, rolls through multiple different landscapes depicted um, in Ford car ads. So it's about 20 minutes long and it literally just like rolls through as if it's a kind of assembly line itself. 
through these different um, uh, ways in which uh, these these landscapes were depict, depicted by uh, in Ford car ads. And um, I took mostly took I literally took all of the cars out, and then there's some people, but there's not that many people. So it kind of has this like apocalyptic um, vibe to it, like these empty uh, spaces that were you know meant to be the the way in which these cars were ad advertised to publics. So I'm just going to show you a short clip of, of this. It's just one section of a, a very long animation, um, but yeah, you just get to experience a little bit of it. So um, that animation goes on and on <laughs> like that. Um, so after finishing this animation, um, I turned to focus more on Fordlandia. Um, although that animation, you know, I was thinking a little bit about Fordlandia, the most, the focus of that was about the Ford car advertisements. So after that, I spent some more time in the Henry Ford archives in Dearborn. And um, I just was, you know, looking through these different papers that were just super bureaucratic and like really just, you know, showed how they, this obsession with this rational organization of the rubber plantation. And the, the archive, you know, really all, all of the information just showed how much the, this, um, 
you know, archive was was from the point of view of the managers. And um, I was really thinking about what, what it would have been like for the workers and you can't find, you know, any kind of like information from that point of view, you have to like look at it through these bureaucratic um, uh, uh, texts. Like for example, this image is of um, the damage that like listing the, the cost that it would have, um, a cause after the the riot that happened, and um, you know the damages that occurred to say it says here the, the the summary of the garage and truck damages, and it's just the list of 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 the prices that that, that would have occurred. Um, so I was like really thinking about well, um, what can I, how can I um, bring this archive up to life in a way that both would honors like some aspects of what it would have been like for the workers at the time, but knowing that that's impossible to do that. How can I think about the relationship that that history has to the to the present? So one of the things I was thinking about was um, like, what's the conditions of workers now in relation to that history? Um, and, and like, what's the conditions of workers within a post Fordist context? So the, the way in which Fordism has had a massive influence on our present um, situation in relation to organization of work. Like how, how can I think about this example of Fordlandia in a, in a way that, that um, you know, treats the, 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 the historical fiction as something that can, can bring light to the conditions of people now. Um, and so I turned to um, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, one of the reasons that I did that was because um, I, it struck me as a kind of organization of work that is the Fordism on steroids. And um, I was thinking about, you know, the, the extraction of rubber was a really, you know, big deal at the time of when Fordlandia existed. So what's the, the good? What's the kind of um, you know consumer good that is equivalent to rubber? Like what's something that is just as big business as what rubber used to be? And um, I think data is one of those things, right? Data is um, a really you know really big bucks these days. And so um, Amazon Mechanical Turk is one way in which um, data um, is um, extracted. And so Amazon Mechanical Turk started in 2005. Um, it's a crowdsourcing platform that allows for gathering of mass data from humans. Um, requesters, um, who requesters are um, corporations or um, individuals or entrepreneurs, anyone who wants to get you know, access to uh, let people on the platform across the, across the world, they put, on, put out a hit, which is short for a human intelligence task <clears throat> to gather data. And this data often comes in the forms of questionnaires, image identifications, and other types of click work. Um, it's human labor. And some of, some of the time this data is used to um, feed machine, um, AI machine learning. Um, there are many workers situated all over the world. Um, and um, but mainly in the US and India, and um, it's you know a platform to gather large forms of data. And uh, to me, it's like an extension of the assembly line, a kind of global expansion of the assembly line. So um, I um, have been working on this project for a couple of like for a while now, for a few years, and um, I um, you know. Uh, at certain point, I worked with different Amazon Mechanical Turk workers and the, 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 the guys who are in the film, the, the, the video that I'll show you a clip of, they're the ones that, that um, stuck with me throughout the whole time. But I did work with others who, for various different personal reasons, couldn't continue to work on the project. Um, but I was thinking, you know, within these workshops that I did with the Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, we, we, we had discussions about the condition, their conditions of work, um, whether the work was fulfilling, what kind of life um, 
does this work enable? Um, you know, some people uh, are like Amy, who's one of the um, uh, participants in, in the video, it suits her really well because of the flexibility of the work. Um, and then, you know, someone else like Hunter, who also works on the platform was, was really um, against um, the ways in which it's, it's like the conditions of work, um, such as being paid extremely low. And the, the thing about Amazon Mechanical Turk is that you, the, the and how do you say the requesters or the, the people who are asking for the work, they never get to see the workers. There's an anonymous um, aspect to it because everyone is working from home. And that really suits um, large corporations because they don't have to deal with, you know, the, the, the humanness of, of workers in such as the fact that they, you know, need to maybe need sick pay or, um, you know, might need uh, like a, I don't know, like the life aspects that, that um, an efficient workforce, work um, company doesn't really want to have to deal with. And um, so this type of platform eradicates a lot of those things. Um, so uh, this is um, Ma 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 Mohammed Wajid's bed, who is um, an Amazon Mechanical Turk worker that I worked with for some time. And um, this is a quote that he um, said. I work at home during, during the daytime. I work in the living room and during the evening and nights, I work on my bed. I just put my laptop beside me and sleep and wake up during the nights to check um, <clears throat> if there is any work or new work available. As of now, I don't mind sleeping on the same bed with my laptop beside me. For me, money is money and it's very important rather than total comfort. So um, I um, basically started to think about the relationship between the American dream and the reality of um, a lot of uh, conditions of, of labor within America. And um, one series of works that I did that came out of this um, research before um, doing the, the, major, the major video that I will uh, show you a clip of is these watercolor series, which um, essentially again uses the uh, Ford car adverts that come from the, um, this archive that I was looking at, and they, it creates a type of collage. So what you're looking at is many, many different Ford adverts being placed together to create a large landscape that, to me, you know, looks a bit like an adventure or a, a kind of like. Um, I don't know, it made me think about the Lord of the Rings or these like ideas of having to, you know, travel really far for, 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 for work. And so I was kind of like mixing up reality and, and fiction in these, these drawings. Um, and then each uh, watercolor often has a, um, a place of the Amazon Mechanical Turk work in the foreground, like for example here, um, is Hunter's um, desk, who is, um, Hunter is um, one of the participants of the video. Um, and this is Amy's bed with her laptop and her cat um, underneath the, the seabed. Um, so the video that is showing at the Tate Brit Britain right now is called Amazon. Um, <clears throat> and uh, in Amazon, I worked with real Amazon Mechanical Turk workers. Um, this is Amy in this video still. Um, each worker received a camera kit that had um, a camera, a kind of a, a consumer camera, which meant that it was accessible to um, the Amazon Mechanical Turk workers to be able to operate it, but it was still a little bit more advanced because I wanted the video to be good quality so that, you know, everyone involved could be proud of the, the, the final product. So it, it had, the kit had lighting, sound and props. So uh, we spent months doing workshops um, with um, Amy, Elizabeth, Greg and Hunter and they, we spent this time over Zoom, you know, shooting these scenes for this film. 
Um, the video is a reenactment of the events that occurred in Fordlandia, all that I discovered um, in the archive, um, such as the workers' riots, for example, um, and other things that I found, like, for example, um, there was a whistleblower who wanted to expose the conditions, the working conditions of Fordlandia, but there was these documents that showed how the managers in Fordlandia wanted to um, you know, um, uh, how do you say, um, you know, stop this from happening. So they accused this whistleblower of being a, a diamond thief. Um, so, you know, it, to me, that was like, wow, this sounds too crazy to be real. So, it, you know, weaving these historical fictions that I found in this archive with the realities of the Amazon Mechanical Turk workers was uh, part of the the, the video. Um, so, you know, sometimes some parts are scripted and sometimes they're, they're not and they're about the conditions of, of work, um, you know, the ways in which these AMT workers live in relation to doing this work. And we use the slippage of the word Amazon and the Amazon as a way of um, containing the, uh, the place. So it, it, it kind of becomes um, as if they're working in the in the Amazon, but that also means working for Amazon and the Calco Turk. And this is a um, image of the studio shoot. So essentially, there's like one part that um, is kind of this fictional Amazon forest that becomes the backdrop for where the the narrative is um, uh, situated. Um, so this is an install image at the Tate Britain and the large anamorphic projection on the back wall um, is where, for example, the, this imagery of this forest um, is situated and then the, there's four monitors that's, that are placed in front of this anamorphic projection and each monitor is usually, it kind of worked in the logic that each monitor was at the home of an Amazon Mechanical Turk worker, so the footage that they we shot with with them in their homes comes up on those monitors and it was sort of felt like the Amazon was the headquarters of the corporation. Uh, and this is a, a image of the mo monitors. And then the in the forest, the, the studio forest, there was like a lot of hand painted plants and so they are placed, a few of them are placed in front of the um, installation and they're you know contained with um how do you say rubber ground rubber rubber tires that becomes like a soil around it now this is another video still um and then there's these um rubber cast data servers that have the plants um uh, that are hand painted uh, growing from them Okay, so I'm just going to show a couple of clips like the video itself is 27 minutes long. Um, so if anyone's interested to see the whole thing, just e email me, but I thought there's no way I can <laughs> show the whole thing and talk. Um, but basically, you know, there's, there's a part where there's a, a, a how do you say a, um, a, an AI who kind of is the narrator of the piece. Um, and then there's the Amazon Mechanical Turk workers who are also uh, characters in, in, the, in the work. Um, and there's different events that happen throughout, uh, throughout the piece, but this is just two, two scenes. should deduct more from their pay. Yeah, the Amazon literally provides everything. I hate this. If I was home in Brazil right now, I would be eating 
fresh maracuja, acai, goiaba. Just like when my grandpa worked in the coal mines and they paid him in company scripts. What a scam. Huh? It's such a corrupt system. Sometimes the pitches are rancid. We brought white man's magic to the wilderness, intending to cultivate not only data, but the data gatherers as well. But we are having trouble with the native workers who are encouraged to conform to a more efficient style of life. This includes eating a Midwestern style diet deducted from their pay, participating in social events such as square dancing, and living in squad two family houses that are very different from their native homes, which are built high off the ground to keep out animals and insects. The workers complain of stomach trouble due to the unfamiliar diet of hamburgers and canned peaches. They also do not like working the hours we expect, preferring to work before sunrise and after sunset due to the heat. Because of these lifestyle changes, there is significant amount of turnover in the plantation. By bringing back square dancing as well as other primarily Anglo-Saxon dances, we believe we may counteract the unwholesome influence of jazz on America. People will leave the dance halls and cabarets in droves to swing their partners round and round at liquor-free square dance clubs. Jazz is the cause of America's moral decay. The road to repair is as simple as replacing it with fiddles and square dances. by the right and your grand right and left half all around first by your right hand and the next one by your left to that little old cabin in the lane when you meet your partner you make your homeward flight to that little old cabin in the lane little old cabin in the lane Let's speed it up. Well, all going hands in circle left around. 
the hole. No, oh, what will replace you? I promise. If you go wrong, you'll be rejected, and I'll take that little old cabin in the lane. Little old cabin in the lane. Raising you in the balance all you get to lay the rain. I'll tell you folks how this is how you swing. The left hand on your corner is the time for your hire. A little old cabin in the lane. 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 The left hand on your corner is the time for your hire. To that little old cabin in the lane. Okay, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm just going to quickly talk about this. Um, so th there was also a live version of this project called Amazon Proxy that was shown in Performer London. Um, so the narrative was very similar, but the difference was that there was four actors who you can see in the front here that played um, AI who were training from the Amazon Mechanical Turk workers. <clears throat> so essentially the, um, the, the premise of the narrative was that these guys here were um, situated in um, a forest or in Fortlandia and were um, basically in the, in the fiction um, learning how, more how, how to become human. Um, and they endured brutal, brutal working conditions and um, some of the things that, that happened in Fortlandia were you know, narratively happening through the performance. And the more they learned from the AMT workers, the human AMT workers, the more they became human and rejected their conditions. And there's just one little clip of this. I am Proxy D, and I am machine learning to become human from the AMTs who are at home doing hits, supplying the data we need. This is AMT worker Amy. I am Amy and I live in Portland. I live with my roommate and my cats and I recently have been caring for some little squirrels. I am Proxy C. This is AMT worker Greg. I'm Greg. I'm originally from Brazil, but I've lived most of my life in Spain. I like playing video games. I'm Proxy B. This is AMT worker Hunter. I'm Hunter. I live in Atlanta with my wife and two kids. Uh, I'm a chef and I studied art. But we study them all so we can learn the most from their data. Uh, I'm Hunter. I live in Atlanta with my wife and two kids. Uh, I'm a chef and I studied art. I'm Proxy A. This is AMT worker Elizabeth. I uh, live in West Virginia. I used to work in construction. I love to swim and I take care of my two kids. Well, I feel like this job is pretty easy compared to most jobs. I can take mental health days when I want. Sometimes I'm not feeling up to doing anything. Well, 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 I, I, feel I feel like this job is pretty easy compared to most jobs. I can take mental health days when I want. Okay, so that ends that that's it. Okay. Um, that's a very short clip. Um, that's 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 very quick glance into um, these different projects, but um, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Danielle. I am going to now ask Danielle and Stephanie to um, kind of comment, if, if you would, on each other's projects now that you've had this opportunity to see a sustained presentation, I think for the first time. Is that correct, Stephanie and Danielle? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, Stephanie, would you like to begin first and then Danielle? Sure. Well, I think I want to start with 
the animations because it really touched me thinking about um, Disney also made this really amazing film that I had in the presentation that I didn't show you called The Amazon Awakes. And it was made in 1945, just before Fordlandia was closed. Um, and it really is this like super positive, everything's going great film um, with a lot of animation. And it's really inspiring to see your interpretation of this, Danielle, because I think also something that really I think both of us are really interested in is the way that images of the world then re like the world reproduces itself in the images that are presented of it um, and this kind of cycle being really important to understanding not only this moment in history but how we're thinking about what we do whether it's through labor or how we organize society is that you know that the kind of narratives we carry and um mm -hmm. the the psychologies that we associate with with whether it's the american dream or these other movements are actually kind of very much shaping the material conditions mm -hmm. um that we have and so yeah i think i think that's a theme that really transpires across both the works even though they're approaching it from really different perspectives that's really important to put forward mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think I was thinking about that also in relation to um, the radio that you set up in Fordlandia um, in Brazil and how that seems like such a fantastic way of taking back that logic, right? Taking back the ways in which um, these systems of power utilize mass media or forms of dissemination of information that are, are, are most of the time not in the um, hands of the people, right? That they're, we're being, you know, um, bombarded this stuff, but we don't have the power to, 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 to um, you know, portray our own stories. So I was really struck by that. I thought it was super interesting. And I'm really curious to know what you, the behind the scenes experience of your workers was like just becoming kind of actors. Um, say, sorry, I'm a bit distracted because um, Lily really wants me to m mention Turkoptican. And if anyone can donate to, to, to um, Turkoptican, that would be super amazing. I just wanted to... Um, say that because they're an amazing organization that are helping um, you know fight for the rights of um, Amazon mechanical Turk workers um, so yeah sorry to interrupt you Stephanie I just wanted to say that before I don't get a, a chance to so could you repeat your question I'm sorry yeah absolutely <laughs> I was just more curious about the kind of behind the scenes experience of your workers who are kind of hired for this very unusual uh, projects yeah. <laughs> yeah um so it was a really long we worked together over a long space of time um so it, it i i i mean i can't speak for them i don't know they have told me that they really really enjoyed working on the project and um so you know I made I made sure I paid them much more than they were being paid on on the site, um, and I it was a little bit complicated at the beginning because it was like how do I connect with the Amazon mechanical Turk workers and um, one of the ways was through Turk Optican um, they have a newsletter and um, I um, they helped me put an ad out for this project um, because I wanted to connect with the workers outside of the logic of the site because the site doesn't allow for connections right it's not about a, a um you know making a connection that continues over time it's like do your work done you may not see that you may not ever see that handle because you don't see people but you never may not see that hit or that work ever again um so that was that was at the big that was one part of the logic of it and then you know i did in the ad it was clear that 
you know, it has to be people who are, you know, not, no, no one w was a professional actor, but they were down for doing the project. You know, they can't work with anyone that um, wouldn't be interested in it. And I never, um, I wasn't sure how much the piece would be more documentary or performative. It kind of developed as we were working together because you, you can't force someone to be performative, but you know, they really went for it. So um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we have some <laughs> comments in the chat that I'll bring forward. Um, let's see, we have just lost it, sorry. Nicole was commenting on the animations being so great. And, and so Danielle, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, bringing animation into the project and um, the, the way that you've worked across different media forms. I think for the design students here, this is, this, is, this is very important to kind of hear about the way that you approach different forms that maybe you haven't used quite as much in the past. You've done a lot of video, but not so much animation and how you brought that in and. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I, have, I have done one animation. I did do an animation before this um, where I taught myself how to do cell animation, um, which was insane. But um, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't really, I, so because my um, focus has been a lot to do with the history of advertising as a, um, like, I mean, it's not just that, but that's one aspect of what I have been looking at. And within that context, everything goes, <laughs> basically animation, video, a combination of animation with video, um, you know, even live performance, like there's no, boundary to what you know advertising agencies will do to get the attention of viewers so I think my practice has been influenced by that that not having a limit to what I will work with and um and I also really enjoy being an amateur of those things so I don't know how to do animation really very well and the video looks a little like you know it's no Disney movie <laughs> and I, but I like to be an amateur of that stuff so that it doesn't become too far into, you know, a final product, like that an audience might be able to see the, the edges or, um, yeah. yeah. Edges, that's the perfect word because it really gives us the, criti it, it gives us the critical edge and it keeps us from slipping over into mm -hmm. just the aesthetic appreciation apart from the critique that you're bringing to the to the form the commercial form that you're that you're analyzing um so stephanie your work in radio has a similar kind of slippage into a form of of public media um that i don't think did you work a lot in radio before that time and it's kind of an overlap where you know danielle's working with the the worker platform and you're working with the radio platform and maybe you could um, kind of both talk about that a bit. Sure. Well, I'll just say also my co-conspirator is in the room, Augustina Woodgate. We started this radio station actually in, I think it was like 2011 or something. And we'd say, oh, we have an online radio and people would say, but where do I go to listen? And we'd say, no, you just go to this link and you listen. And they'd say, but where do I go? And so there was like, it was at this moment, like before that, like podcasting or anything, but we were really interested in different ways of occupying space. And we did a lot of different projects that were in abandoned spaces and in really complicated spaces and sort of found that we needed a, a way and a mode to start like um, connecting with people, but also finding a intermediation point because it's really like strange to go into a place where you're not from or familiar or comfortable and just like kind of chat to people or just like do research in this way. But it was a much more exciting prospect for everyone. I think that if we were using the radio platform as a way to kind of co-create 
together. And so that kind of inspired the experiment. And then um, it sort of evolved into really a project doing marathons about mobility and movement. So that's always the topic, but it's always very site specific and in situ and then kind of designed in relation to the environment where it is. So, you know, in the Bay Area, it was in a self in a Tesla, um, a broadcast called Autopilot in a self-driving car or in Miami in um, a new park that was being created. It was on a 16 person bicycle. And so just always adapting forms. Um, but I think we're always like, it needs to also adapt to the different, to the forms that it's finding. So it's kind of, it's in constant flux and relationship with how do we actually use it as a medium to get the word out in the situations where we are. So whether it's like, and then the sound is played on a subway alongside a podcast, or it's, um, you know, like in future broadcasts on billboards along a highway so that like it's explaining something in the environment that everyone can understand. So it's kind of giving voice to not only not only people, but kind of environments that might otherwise be mute. Um, yeah. Danielle, your strategy is, is really different because it's much more gallery oriented. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I mean, um, I think that, that it's true that I always make a final piece that shows in a museum or in a gallery, but the strategy is not that dissimilar in the sense that there's a lot of workshops that go into making it along the way. And, um, you know, I don't want to sound, but, I think that a lot of the time there is the work that's happening during that time, but I I don't know if we would. It, I always feel like it. The reason that we're all together is the is the thing that gives it the the reason to be discussing things that we wouldn't have been discussing together if it hadn't been for this project. You know, so although I do see that issue sometimes of like you know making work for a museum although a museum is great because you, that's actually a place where a lot of different people can see the work but a gallery can be a little bit complicated but yeah I I think that the 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 work has two different modes of operating during the workshops and then the final product but then I feel like everyone can be proud of of it at the end if it's if it's good and and yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I think that's a good thing, yeah. So really emphasizing that participatory production, uh, those months yeah. of participatory production as collaborative and generative for the community of people who are speaking through your work. Yeah, because sometimes not everything goes in the work that happens. Like there's a lot of stuff that happens in the workshops that you know, you can't just force everything to be in the artwork, but those moments are, are um, you know, generative and are doing something that, that um, the artwork does in, in a different way. Great. So Stephanie's mentioned that Agustina Woodgate is here. So welcome, Agustina. Um, it was great seeing your collaborative work in Stephanie's presentation. But she 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 might be just listening and like actually working on something. She, <laughs> she's she's coming over the chat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, other questions from the audience? Comments? Hey, sorry, I was just chatting you and I realized that you had texted me privately. How are you? It's a pleasure to to see you both coming together in this um somewhat uh, research that has so many so many uh, points that connect from from a different angle hi everyone also welcome <laughs> yeah. i think m has a question no? hi yeah i didn't want to like say something if everybody's still talking but i had how do you guys do such a beautiful job 
of using your work to tell the stories of other people using such an artistic like medium and still keeping it so beautifully like representative of the individuals that you're giving like a voice to through your work like what's the process of doing that <laughs> I don't know. Stephanie, do you want to answer that? That was a great question, and thank you. I didn't mean to. I was just like, wow, I don't, I don't know how to answer it. But um... sure, I can start. I can start. Yeah. Um, so I guess um, whenever we do a broadcast, we we visit a place a few times. This was actually this visit was very unusual because you can't just like go to Fort Lange and then go back again like it's sort of like you get one time um but it was really important to us to partner with with people that were there so we kind of we it's always like this a little bit of like okay who do we know in in brazil and then who does that person know and so we're really using networks of people to then like get closer and closer to kind of the people we want to talk to so it's really very much about human connections and then um, so we had a group, we traveled with a group of five sound artists who were like from different parts of Brazil, but uh, and a curator who is from um, Belang, which is a city just a few hours, I mean, a few hours in Amazon time, maybe eight hours north of, of Forlandia, but like very quite close in terms of ex uh, experience in that sense. And um, like a lot of, you know, we would like just call like we would call the pharmacy um, and be, and like, then it, we realized that everyone was actually on WhatsApp. And so it was like, oh, now we have like the connection to, the whole project started in some ways because we knew a woman who had gone, who told us that the radio people were the people to hang out with. When like, she's like, when you go to Forlandia, talk to the radio people. And we were like, wait, what radio people? They have radio people. So it was kind of like finding the nodes in a community that have the connections to lots of other nodes. And then, I think for us, at least, it's really about that's why I think the platform logic is useful for us is that we're just we're kind of opening up a channel and then finding a structure in which to invite people to engage their stories. And sometimes that's and we really like that. I mean, the thing about standardization is that it can open up a lot of adaptability. So in this case, you have a standardized segment that's an hour or a half hour um, and you've got microphones and you've got a couple different languages that you want to speak in so that different audiences can understand. Um, but for us, then the program can really take shape according to who it is. So we had like an hour long, really informal session chatting with the, the um, woman who cooked dinner for the crew every night. Like we brought her on the show and like she told us about her process of cooking and it was like a hilarious segment or we sort of did a more formal interview with um, the mayor of the town. So really um, finding those systems. I mean, this is why um, as difficult as the Ford story is, there's also some real inspirations from it for a, for a creator producer, because if we started from scratch every single time and didn't have kind of systems in place that we knew worked, then we would, we would never get there. So it's, I think for us, it's trying to build a platform that's really flexible um, but that has got just enough structure to allow for that flexibility in, in situ. So hopefully that gives a little bit of a sense. Um, always have a coffee with your guests before you have them on the show, though, no? Like, <laughs> it's a, a, definitely a rehearsal. Yeah, and I, for me, it was about time, like being able to spend a lot of time with who I was working with meant that we got to know each other. And so then everyone felt comfortable. Like, I don't know, like I think the fact that um, the uh, um, AMT workers were shooting themselves in their own homes also was a step one for them to feel more comfortable in being on camera. So I have done, you know, projects where we've like I worked with my sister in Houston, Texas, and we went with a very small camera crew, but because it was my sister and there was just a couple of people, it wasn't so intense. But can you imagine like going with a bunch of people 
a camera crew to someone's house and just you know pointing a camera at them that can be really um, oppressive so I think this method of of um, really getting to know everyone who's in the team spending a lot of time together and then it also being distant so you know and, and having that distance so that they could really control their own image really really helped thank you both those were phenomenal answers Em, I really appreciated the um, focus that you put on the aesthetic part of it, um, because you're emphasizing, and I think this is really critical for, for students in our group, that um, it's not so much just about handing over the camera, and it, it's also about creating an array of possibilities for the, um, the ways of using the camera and then the aesthetic framing of engaging with the, the material that's generated by the camera afterwards as a continued point of engagement and creation. And in Stephanie's situation, there's such a rich history of radio in South America. Um, I know a little more about the Argentina context and radio and political activism when you just can't use images. And so there's, there's so much that's really rich there. Um, and in Danielle's situation, the idea of being seen because the whole idea of the task rabbit is you don't see your rabbit. Yeah, um, exactly. So you make visibility um, politicized, not just by giving it a talking head, but by giving this it, giving it this rich array of, of creative compositions that are not just the artist imposing them. Um, so great question, Em. Do we have other questions from the audience in the last few minutes that we have? It's a shy group this evening. Stephanie and Danielle, um, do you want to say a few closing words each about, um, about where you think you might be going with these projects? And um, maybe if you could, if you wouldn't mind saying a little something about the fact that you know, you're both in a department together where Stephanie has, is just on the verge of getting a PhD that emphasizes her art practice and where she came into the program as a practicing artist with a public profile and work that did this kind of social, socially embedded engagement at sites. And Danielle came in as an artist who works so uh, intensely with the history of the media forms in which she's engaging and in which she researches so deeply. So could you say a little something about about the kind of intersections that you you both engage in from the context of our department, visual arts. <clears throat> I can go for it. I, I can I can start. Um I guess I mean I was I'm really grateful to the visual arts department for kind of I came in in having spent a long time in the art um field but I really found design and I feel much more comfortable as a designer than an artist I, I almost never work alone um and for me like all of the kind of ways of navigating space and production um so I've really come to understand myself as a designer and the work the research work as a form of speculative history because throughout um the narrative that I'm exploring, which you didn't hear a lot about today, but it's always about looking back to project forward and kind of having this ongoing relationship between how the future changes our understanding of the past. Um, and so that's been really rich and fruitful. And then to have the design lab actually as a place to practice, not only um, things like radio which can be more in an aesthetic domain but also to kind of work as a strategist and actually be part of research communities in which um i'm like the weirdo imaginative uh writer creative person in a team of scientists or or researchers has just been really exciting so that ucsd really gave me a way to kind of scale in a way that I always wanted to with the work. Um, so yeah, that's been really fun. And then I guess the last thing to say is I'm now running this program in narrative environments and we're doing 
a lot of work exploring how sound and um, broadcasting can play a role in changing what we experience in our daily lives. But of course, questions around how AI and AR and um, all of these different ways in which the environment will continue to be narrated um, in, in unexpected ways through technology is something that we're thinking a lot about now. So I guess that's my forward-looking vision. Over to you, Danielle. Yeah, um, well, in the context of UCSD, it's been great being able to um, work with faculty both within the visual art department, but outside as well. Um, for example, um, Lily Iriani, who's here, was really helpful and uh, amazing for, for me with this project. And actually now we've become really good friends and um, that it started with me being like, Lily, please talk to me. <laughs> like just cold emailing her from, from my studio. <laughs> so yeah, that's been amazing. And um, I've been really busy, but I'm hoping now I finish this project, I can, you know, be a bit more collaborative with, with UCSD too, because um, I would really like to work with the Indigenous Futures Lab, which um, my partner Manuel is part of, and I'd really like to be able to be more involved. I just haven't, haven't been able to do that yet, but that's my future plan. Um, yeah, I think it's it's um, a, a great school in the sense of all of the um, uh, ways in which you can collaborate outside of the department and within. Thank you so much, Danielle and Stephanie. This was really such an important episode for us for Design at Large in its in its collaboration with visual arts and in the relationship between art practice and um, art history theory and criticism as it extends to urban design and computing culture and so many other domains in which all of us work across the social sciences, the arts and the humanities. So, um, and the sciences as well. So thank you. And I would like to just, um, give a heads up about next week. Uh, first of all, let us thank Danielle and Stephanie. Yay, clap, clap, clap. <laughs> and um, congratulate them on all their incredible accomplishments and, and work on these projects in this year. And I would like to leave off by reminding everyone in our last minute about the upcoming seminar with Kelima Moses and James Miller uh, who will be here in San Diego. And I don't know if we'll get it off the ground to do this hybrid, but for those of you who would like to be at the design lab in person, um, we'll give it a shot and we'll email everybody to let you know uh, what the deal is for next Wednesday when I, when I put, my, um, put my thoughts to figuring out next week's event. They'll be talking um, about troubling housing process and pedagogy in Oceania. And they'll be looking at the limits, parameters, and innovative possibilities of housing in Oceania. And I'm sure they'll be talking about the naming of Oceania as a designated region. Um, they're interested in planning processes and accounting for imminent climate considerations and the role of stakeholders who are invested in site-specific and site responsive, uh, responsive approaches to natural and built environments and questions of housing justice, climate, land justice, and um, restorative justice. See you all next week, and thanks for being with us at Design at Large from the sky to the ocean floor. Take care, everybody.